It is good to see you this morning. Welcome to summertime. Finally got here. Praise the Lord. School out? Are we done with school for a little while? Some of y'all still in school? Oh, that's of the devil. <laughs> Has to be. School could never get out quick enough for me. It's good to see you. I'll be preaching a message in a little bit. Uh, in fact, I stole the title from my brother, one of the first sermons I heard him preach after I gave my life to Jesus, so it's nice that he's here today. But his being here kind of reminds me of a story, praise the Lord, that uh, I had heard, which kind of also leads right to the sermon about a guy who gets off an airplane, gets outside the airport, jumps in a taxi, and taxi driver gets the address and heads out, just speeding out of the airport and driving down the road and sees a red light and doesn't stop, doesn't slow down, but just boom, right through the red light. Guy in the back seat's going, no, what are you doing? Are you crazy? I mean, that's a red light. You just ran a red light. I said, that's, that's all right. Settle down. My brother does it all the time. <laughs> so, so you're going down the block a little later. And my, another red light doesn't slow down, doesn't break, doesn't, nothing. You just <laughs> right through the red light again. The guy says, are you out of your mind? You're going to kill us. I said, listen, it's okay. My brother does it all the time. You're driving down the road, guy's sweating in the back, seat. finally the light's green, you know, he sees the light turn green in front of him, the guy just stops at the green light. Slows down, stops, it's the green, you can go on the green lights, why don't you go? He said, hey, you never know when my brother's coming through. <laughs> Been the motto of my life. <laughs> Slow down, you never know when he's coming through. Praise the Lord. But we live in that kind of generation that doesn't care about the signs and the warnings, don't we? That doesn't, doesn't get it, doesn't, you know, good is bad, bad is good, right is left, left, right, you know, whatever I want it to be, that's what it is. That's the way I feel about it, that's what I think, and God knows I'm sovereign. <laughs> Amen. In fact, I, it said I stole this title from him because it is certainly appropriate to the culture that we live in. There it is, there's pushing buttons and nothing's happening, you may have to help me out there. It's called The Night That Belshazzar Got Busted. And uh, this is the night, that some of you are familiar with this story, maybe you hadn't read it, but you are familiar with it, because out of this event comes that old adage that says, you know, the handwriting's on the wall, uh, which means, you know, it's obvious, things are evident, but it really means much more than that when we start looking at the story about the night that Belshazzar got busted. Interesting place in scripture in the book of Daniel. In reality, everything that happens in Daniel has a has kind of a dual thing going on. One is the actual stories that happen and the events that are occurring, real actual events. These people even verified in history as, as lived. But even greater than that is a bigger, broader picture of the end times. And everything that happens there represents the, the, those days and the, uh, prior to the Lord's return uh, when nations will rise and crumble and fall and divisions will happen and war and rumors of war. All those things are, are kind of foretold, and not kind of, they're really foretold in the book of Daniel. So you get a great prophetic blow up and picture of the end times. But there are some very interesting events that do take place in this story. And one of them is this story about Belshazzar the king. He's the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Nebuchadnezzar is the guy who has the dream and builds the big image, the golden image to himself, the golden head and the silver chest and the bronze and goes down to lesser valued items all the way down to the feet of this statue which are made up of iron and clay. Now, as he has the dream and no one can interpret it, finally Daniel comes in and tells him the meaning of the dream. And Daniel's an elevated uh, position in the kingdom, and now he's even in a higher position because of his ability to translate this dream to the king. And the king that is told the story about th th what this vision represents in regard to the last days and the nations of the last days. And he's telling him, hey, you know, the greatest nation you're the king of. The king, the head of gold, represents the Babylonian Empire. The greatest nation that will ever, there'll be, never be another nation as big, as vast, and as powerful as the Babylonian Empire. And every nation that precedes that will be lesser of, of an influence and lesser of a power in the world. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is excited about this so much so, you know, he begins to, to realize, you know, that uh, it must be due to his greatness. Even though Daniel's told him that God has given him this position, and it, Nebuchadnezzar gets to the place where uh, he begins to think that he's done all this, even though God has revealed to him that he is where he is by the divine hand of God. It is a sovereign God who great, gave him everything that he's got. But yet one day while walking on his balcony, he says, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. <laughs> 
And he realizes that he thinks he's in charge of all things and God appears to him and says, you're not the man, I'm the man. I'm God, you're not. I told you that you have what you have as a gift from me. But now since you've lifted up yourself against God, and what basically the story goes that God allowed madness to come. And I think the Bible says seven seasons, whether that's seven years or summer, winter, 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 fall, whatever. It's seven seasons of time that he goes through and he becomes a madman. He strips his clothes off, lives like a wild beast, eats the grass in the field, you know, just he literally loses his mind. He goes nuts. Until the end of that time, when sanity comes back, God allows it to come back to him and he realizes that God's God and I'm not. Now, that story ends there in chapter 4, and it picks up in chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar's gone on to meet the God who is, and his son now has risen to authority in the kingdom. And do, do me a favor back there. Click these verses for me as, as I read verses 1 through 12, all right? Belshazzar, Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, this is his son, the king, held a, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and the silver, the vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from him. They drank the wine and praised the Lord. No, they praised the gods of gold, of silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And suddenly, a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. And then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack. His knees began knocking together. This is your first biblical example of breakdancing, all right? <laughs> Verse 7. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers and the Chaldeans and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. All the king's men and all the king's couldn't put hump in their mouth to destroy. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. And King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. And then the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles, and the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom a spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father, illumination, Insight, wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King, King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, you know, he appointed him chief of the magicians and conjurers, the Chaldeans and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight and interpretation of, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned and he will declare the interpretation. So here we have a unique story, and let's just kind of lay it out. It, it certainly would make for a great movie today. Uh, it certainly has all the elements of a great drama. This, besides, as I mentioned, remember, this is a real story. You know, this isn't Grimm's fairy tales. This, this really happened. So as you look at the story, though, let's just lay out the characters very quickly. You have this, this list of characters that appear. Here's Belshazzar. Uh, obviously, he's, he's the king's son. He's pretty much been given everything his whole life. He hadn't had to earn anything. He hadn't had to do anything. You know, he's the mama's boy. But he's, at the same time, he, he goes around and he struts his stuff like he is the man, the man, the man. The lesson his father had to learn the hard way, he didn't learn at all. And he goes around, he's, 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 the, he's Mr. Self-Sufficient, he doesn't need anybody, he doesn't need anything, at least in this point in his life, and he's just doing whatever feels good. He, he has that mindset of the modern day culture that if that's what I want, then I'll get it. If it's something I feel like, then I'll do it. If that's what I desire, then I'll take it. He, he's this guy that nobody's going to tell me what to do. Now, it pretty much represents the, the lot of Americans today, isn't it? Isn't that pretty much where everybody is today? You know, I, I, I know what God says. I know what the law says. I know what the culture says. But I, I'm my own man. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, I'm going to do however I feel like doing it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have my own way. It gets back to, again, that little song we just chirped a while ago. I'm the man. I'm the man. Look at me. I'm self-sufficient. I can pull myself up, take care of myself. 
but he discovered he's not so much the man. And then there, there's the queen mother. It says she, she entered the banquet hall speaking. There's where you get in trouble right there, amen? She just comes in and she's just got the answer all of a sudden. You know, she's, just, she's, she's pretty much the mouth of what's going on at this point. Uh, as far as biblical types and characters, to me, she could easily represent the devil, Satan, his little minions and demons that go around constantly, you know, carrying out the biddings of, of their Lord and Master Satan. She comes in and out of her mouth is this, chill out. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. You can get yourself out of this. We've got a plan. We've got a man for this. You know, we've got somebody, this is their job. Don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Now, it's nice to hear that, and especially when you're a believer and you're right with God, everything's going to be okay. Because the Bible tells us as believers who are in a right relationship with God that all things work together for good to those who love God. All right? So you don't have to worry. Even though, even though the storms may rage, it's going to be okay. You're being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's working out, all right? But I don't like it. It's still okay, all right? But on the other hand, if you're not what God's called you to be and you're not right with God, I wouldn't be listening to anybody who says it's going to be okay. That's the last thing you need to hear. You don't need somebody who looks at you and you're filled with cancer and say, hey, I got a cure for that, and rub some Vaseline on your nose. That's about the effect of what's going to happen here, all right? There, there, there's no solution for the problem. And then, then there, remember, as you read the story, there's the conjurers, the astrologers, the soothsayers, and the sorcerers. Now, that's a happy group, isn't it? You know, if you brought them into the modern world, I give them TV shows called Oprah, <laughs> Dr. Phil, you know, and all these other, you know, modern-day soothsayers who, who have the pleasant, you know, words for people who are going to make them feel happy. and fit. A lot of pastors fit this category, going to come in on Sunday, rub a little ointment on our cancer, and everything's, God loves you, everything's okay, let's all be happy, let's smile, you know, be nice to the dogs and the neighbors, and everything can't get any better. Yeah, that's not the answer that they're needing. And, they, you know, these guys are, are, are not what we're looking for. And then you see amongst the group here, uh, the happy group, is the friends. These are the thousands of the king's notes. These are his closest, you know, people. These, this is, these, these are my friends. You know, this is, this is the posse. This is the group that's around me. This is what I, these are the people that I can influence and, you know, that all think I'm something, you know, special. I gotta have, gotta have my minions around me. Gotta have my peoples around me that, you know, that know that I am the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. And this to me, obviously, it can certainly translate into the political arenas of our world, the Hollywood arena of our world, or even the local high school. Amen. Uh, th you see this over and over and over. People just being led like sheep to the slaughter because everybody else is doing it. And so-and-so, he's popular, he's doing it. And he's the president, he's doing it. You know, he's, the he's doing it. So it must be all right for me to do it. And just following blindly along because somebody said they ought to do it. Now, the next person in the, in the story is one that's, that's uniquely remember, he's not at the party. <laughs> they have to go get him for the party, all right, to bring him in. He's not, that says multitude right there, doesn't it? So he's not there, even though he's one, he is in a place of leadership in the kingdom. He's not there. I don't need to be there. I, that's, you know, I, 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 haven't, I haven't drank the Kool-Aid, all right? I know better. I know what's going on. I have reality before me. I see truth. I know what's happening. So they bring him in, and he's the man with the answer. He's the man with the words from God. He's the man with the wisdom of God in his life. Now, the queen mother, she talks about words like he's the spirit of the gods. She just shows her ignorance right off the bat. You know, this is kind of like, I feel like watching modern day TV when some of these people come on and they've got the answer. You've got the answer for your children. You've got the answer for your marriage. And what they say is so much junk and so empty and such pseudo, you know, uh, pseudo truth. It sounds good. You think it's going to be good, but there's no substance to it. You know, it's... It's, it's just saccharine. It's not real sugar, you know. It's, it's, not the real, it's not real stuff. So here you have this crowd. And, of course, then you have this hand that shows up. Now, obviously, the hand is the hand of God writing on the wall. So there's your cast of characters. Now, we move from the cast of characters. We go to the, to the storyline. Now, this is, this is not a happy story. This is a story that, that's a story of judgment, all right? This is, this is not the fairy tale ending you get out of Hollywood, that you can just do whatever you want to and everything's going to be all right at the end. You can make an absolute wreck of your life, but not to worry. Everything's going to work out because we're going to write it in just right. You, know? you can live in ungodliness. You can live in immorality. You can live, but it's going to be okay. Yeah, we got a happy ending. And they lived happily ever after. That's not this story. 
This is not a story that ends with, with, with flowers and, 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 and sweet-smelling roses and rainbows. It's a story of judgment. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis of, in, in history, in a critical moment, obviously, in this man's life. Remember, we said this is not a fairy tale. This guy existed. And he's like so many people in our world today. They exist, and that's all that's happening. They're just taking up time and space because until a man meets God and a woman meets God, that's pretty much all you do. You're just, you're just inhabiting time and space, breathing in air. Life means nothing. There's no destiny in your life that means something until you get right with God. And God has the plan, and he has the purpose for our lives. So here we have this story, and it's about judgment. Now, again, this is not a story you're going to hear a lot in pulpits even today. Because we forgot this essence, we forgot this element of judgment, but yet the scripture says, in fact, Jeremiah says that, you know, this God whom we serve, he gives us this message. If you want to glory in something, if you're going to be excited about something, if you're going to bring honor to something, glory in this, that you understand and know that I am the Lord. And I am the God who exercises and delights in loving kindness, judgments, and righteousness. In these things I delight. We like to talk about the first one, the loving kindness. Oh, God loves me. I'm okay. You're okay. It's going to be all right. God loves everybody. And then we like, even might even mention a little bit on the other side, you know, righteousness. Oh, we all, you know, we want righteousness, even though we don't understand what righteousness is, all right? It means being holy. It means being Christ-like. It means being, allowing God to transform your life into the image of Jesus, righteous, right standing, right place with God. But nestled in between those nice words, loving kindness and righteousness, is this word judgment. Now, I don't know why everybody gets their tail in such a spin over this issue about God being a God of judgment. You know, we live in a world right now, we exercise judgment all the time. We have prisons, you know. We don't just tell prisoners God loves you and let them go, right? We exercise judgment. We, use, we have righteous standards and righteous judgment. So we have some laws. You break the law, you, you know, it's going to cost you. You're going to pay a penalty for it. So does it, does it surprise us that God's a just God? Well, what little justice we have ultimately flows from him. So here we have this story where God holds people accountable. And it's a story of accountability. And it's a tragic story because literally it could be, you know, it's, it's though Belshazzar moves from living to judgment. And in this judgment moment, he steps from life and light and the grace of God that he's been living in, whether he realizes it or not, God let him breathe another day, he steps across the line into this area, what we might call tombstone territory, death row. And he doesn't even know it. Doesn't even know it. And as you follow the story, not even to the very end, ignorant, blind. And he's a blind leader of the blind. So you follow the story, it's a story of judgment. But let's, let's build the first, in, the, the first scene, all right, in, in the storyline. There's a party. It's a big party. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, of, as we said before, it's the who's who list in the, in the Babylonian kingdom. It's, a, it's the top-notch guys. It's the best of the best. It's the best sports leaders. It's the best, you know, actors and actresses. It, you know, you got, you got everybody who's anybody. If you, if you brought this into the modern-day world right here, it doesn't take us long to compile this list, does it? We can come up with a thousand names real quick who would be on this list if, the, if, if, if we're holding the big party that Belshazzar had. But it's not just a party. If you read verses 2 and 4, it just turns into a drunken, open revelry and rebellion. I mean, it just turns into an obscene place where all these people getting wasted out of their minds, you know, uh, are, are just making and going on and on. It's, it's party central. And by the way, isn't that the anthem of the culture we live in? Isn't that the anthem? It's party. It's time to party, man. Summer's here. Party! Friday, party! Saturday, party! What's the advertising? The beer commercials, party! Liquor commercials, vodka, party! Time to get the naked women in and the macho men in. Let's all party! That's the culture, is it not? I mean, you hear it in every school, you hear it in every TV, every movie. We have whole movies about party! i tell you, by the way, that what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. Hopefully there's some medicines. <laughs> Belshazzar's getting ready to learn this lesson. In fact, he, here, here's the way it works. Because the whole essence of the party is that 
just, there's no status thing. I, I got to have a little more, you know. This is, and the world doesn't get it. That no, no matter how much more you get, you're still not happy. You know, I, how many of y'all remember the cartoon character back when they used to have newspapers, you know, they had a cartoon section? Uh, Grimm and Mother Goose, or Mother Goose and Grimm. Some of y'all remember, uh, this means yes. All right. Uh, uh, which one was the dog? I guess the dog was Grim, or I don't know. Anyway, and this dog Grim was in the cartoon. It's always a pretty funny cartoon. But in this one cartoon, I remember he had his head down in the toilet and he's just slurping it up. <laughs> yeah, just getting after it, water splashing and everything. He's, next one, he's got little paws on on the, on the toilet seat. You know, and he lifts up his head, shakes his head, and says, "It don't get no better than this." <laughs> this is where Belshazzar's at and doesn't realize it. This is where the world is and doesn't realize it. If they could just see everything that God has set aside, all that God has done and all that God gives, it looks like a sewer over here. Smells like a sewer. But people always say, well, where the grass is greener. Well, let me tell you, the grass is always greener over the sewer. Amen? It's always greener over the septic tank. At least at my house it is. So be careful when you start yarning for the greener grass. So here it comes. This is the apex of the party. Belshazzar looks around the room and says, it's not fun anymore. Not fun anymore. And he calls for the vessels. This is where we cross the line. These holy vessels that were used in worship for a holy God are brought in. And now we transgress and we exalt ourselves and material things and worship the created and the creature more than the creator as they begin to praise the gods of gold and silver and stone and begin to exalt themselves in all these things at Party Central. And here it goes. First of all, the lesson is this. Sin never satisfies completely. It satisfies for a moment. I'll tell you that. Pleasure in sin for what? A season. Now, some of you have been in season a little too long. And that's a dangerous thing. Because there is pleasure in your sin for a season. But when are you going to realize and wake up one day that says, this ain't it. You know, this, this ain't it. There, there came a time in my life when I just woke up one morning and says, I am miserable. I really am miserable. And, and the reason I'm miserable is because I'm doing what I want to be doing, and it's leading nowhere. I'm doing a lousy job at running my life. I mean, does anybody ever come to that place on our own assumption, our own, our own knowledge? No, I believe God does that. I believe God gives us these wake-up moments in time where he wakes us up and in the brief moment we see how futile our life is without God. We see how empty the direction, the course of our life is going without God. There's nothing here. There's emptiness. You know, it's, the, it's the old song from the stones, I can't get no satisfaction. And you never will. That's why that song's so popular today, still today. I mean, Mick Jagger's 104 and the song's still going. He still can't get any satisfaction. <laughs> Wake up. You never will living for yourself and when life's all about you and what you want, what you desire, and you being happy, you're going to be miserable. So sin never satisfies completely. The second thing what you catch from this is sin always leads to more sin. All right? There's, there's all, you've got to take another step. Why, why does it do that? Because it gets boring. Yeah, I, I remember, I think I looked at Phil one day and we were playing clubs and messed up and stoned and everything. I said, hey, we're having fun. Aren't we? <laughs> Aren't we? No, we're not. So you got to do something else. You got to add to it, all right? It's not good enough just to get drunk. Well, I need to smoke some. It's not good enough just to smoke some. Well, I need to snort some. It's not good enough just to, I got I to gotta add some element to this to make it unique, to make it different, to get back up to where it was the first time I, I did it. But it doesn't work that way with sin. Because Satan, he's this great salesman who brings you in and gives you all of it up front for a minute. And it all just vanishes and dissipates slowly but surely. So therefore people reach out and they strive to do, let's do something else, Let, let's do something more. I mean, you follow that, that scenario, read Romans chapter 1 sometime, where, where it says, because they didn't honor God and worship God as God, in the vanity of their minds, and they follow the story because it says, they start seeking other things. Ultimately, he says, they, they sin against God, and they sin against their body. And then he starts talking about homosexual sins and all kinds of reprobate sins. It's just one thing. It's like lining up the dominoes in your life and say, all right, I'll tip this one. Be sure the rest of them pop, 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 pop. 
You can't, you can't say, I'm going to end up in a good place when I know I'm on the wrong road. Stupid. It's not going to happen. You're not going to end up in a good place when you're on the wrong road. And if you're on the wrong road, sooner or later you have to come to your senses and let God convict you of where you are and say, I am really messing up my life. This is what I want. This is where, this is where I want it to go. This is, what, is this all there is to the party? There's more to the party, but you're going to have to leave the party because the real party, the real life is found in what Jesus said. I've come that you might have life and that you might have that life abundantly. You're not going to find it in any kind of smoke. You're not going to find it in any kind of pill. You're not going to find it in any kind of bottle. It's just not there. It's not going to happen. And literally here it says they desecrate these holy temples, these holy vessels, all right, that came from the temple. Well, we do that all the time. God created you so to live in you, so to be with you, so to know you for all eternity. Now, sin has done its filthy, dirty work in our lives. We're born in sin, therefore, we're empty vessels. God's intent is for us to come to him and let him fill these empty vessels with fullness and with life. Real, genuine grace, peace, and satisfaction and glory. God wants to do that in our bodies. That's why the Bible says, when Paul wrote the Romans, he says, listen, your body, it's for the Lord. And the Lord is for your body. Pretty simple, isn't it? God wants to touch your life. God wants to fill your life. God wants to do something. But you're, you're desecrating the, the, the vessels. You're, you're misusing. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that you're the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? For Christians, he's saying, don't go back to the world if you're a believer. That's not where you're... God lives in you. Quit desecrating those temple vessels. Even for a lost person who doesn't know God, in reality, God created you to know you, to live in you, to walk with you, to breathe in you, to move in your life. But it doesn't, there's never going to be satisfaction if you choose to live your own life. Third point I want you to catch this is that sin always seeks to involve other people. I know this from practicality. Why do we always want to get somebody else involved in our mess? Misery loves, <laughs> amen, you know, misery loves company. I always had something, it, it, before I met Christ, that I wanted, you know, you got to try this. Hey, you don't try this, man. You try this, you don't see this, you don't try this, you don't try this, try this is better than that. I tried that, all right, I got old, but this is better than that. And if you take this, oh, it'll be great. You know what happens later, sooner or later? That's not good enough either. So you're, you're incorporating other people. It's like we become evangelists for the devil. You know, kind of, kind of soul destroyers instead of soul winners for Christ. And one of the great, great heartbreaks of my life is this, that when I was lost, I introduced a lot of people to the trash that I was involved in. And by the grace of God, I escaped the dump, the heap, the trash pile. But there's still others that are in there, deep in there, because of what I gave to them. That breaks my heart. The influence that we have, it's either going to be a righteous influence. Every one of us, that's why Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering, then you're doing what? You're scattering. So we, are, we all have a ministry. One way or the other, we're all involved in ministry. But what we ought to be doing is not involving people in unrighteousness, but involving righteousness. The, the fourth element of this is about sin. It always invites disaster. Finish the sentence. The wages of sin is... It still is. It's death. Inflation hasn't bothered it. Recession hasn't touched it. Still pure death. In other words, the result of me going my own way is misery. And you, you know, we've said it before, death never means to cease existing. Because we're all sitting here. I mean, Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you're all just dead men. You're, you're just dead. I've come to you might have and they're thinking about, what do you mean we're dead? We're alive. <sighs> my heart's beating. I got the, my breath in and out. <sighs> yeah, I'm alive. No, we're not. We're just existing. We're separated from God. We're separated from his word. We're separated from his son. We're separated from everything that is life. Separation, that's what death means. It always, and sin always does this. It always breeds separation. It separates us from people we care about, people we love. You know, it just always divides. No matter what we're doing, it's cutting us off and cutting us apart. But when we come to Christ, guess what happens? This is the word I love in the Bible, reconciled. 
No longer separated, no longer cut apart, no longer cut off, brought together. And you see that anthem and that theme all throughout the New Testament that God is reconciling people to himself. We might walk with God and know God. But sin just does the opposite. Well, let's, let's wrap this up kind of, and let's talk about the sudden interruption. There's the, the writing on the wall, the, the meanie, the meanie, tickle you farson, that was scratched out on, on, on the wall. Now, can you imagine, here's the party going on. Got Jay-Z or Beyonce or somebody doing the music in the background, of course. And all of a sudden you hear this. It says it's writing on the plaster wall. Now, I know what fingernails sound like on chalkboard, so I'm not exaggerating too much, am I? Silence falls on the room. The dust from the finger riding on the wall is settling in stone cold silence. Four words. It was a Chaldean language. They, they could read the words, but apparently they couldn't. They were just blind to even what was obvious. But that's what happens when we don't know God. We're blind to the obvious. I mean, what's God doing in your life right now? Some of you, he's drawing to himself in ways that he's never even done before. I mean, God's arranging and rearranging situations in your life to get your attention, and you're just blind to the obvious. The hands write, no thunder, no lightning, just written words. But by the way, folks, every one of us will be held accountable for the same thing, just the written words. God's given us his word. What more do you need? This is it. He's giving, you say, well, I just need, I just, no, no, you don't, it's all here. It's factual, it's verifiable in history, it's actual, it's God's word, it's written, it's still alive, though millions have tried to snuff it out, it's still alive, and it's still living, and it's still changing lives today. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this message, the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. To anybody that believes, God will change your life. Because the day is going to come just like it did for Belshazzar. That we'll all stand before God and we'll all give an account of what we did or did not do with this written word that God has given us. The day's coming. King grows pale, verse 6, verse 7. He calls for help that can't help. And too often people are looking for answers and things that are not going to give them answers. The simple truth is the wages of sin is death, the soul that sin shall die, but he that comes to Christ can have life. He can, listen, don't you, I, I can almost see this in my mind. This big, I mean, we've got thousands of, if not multiples, people here. We know just the nobles alone, but with their little parties involved here, it's just stone cold silence. And then look at the king. You know, he's, his knees won't work, his hips are falling out of joint, and, you know, and, and he's growing pale. Sobering moment for the king. And by the way, I don't think anybody maintains their composure when God really gets on the scene. I've been in services, maybe you've sat in church services like this, when God just falls on the service. And no longer do you have some guy in the high school wing over here sitting there winking at the girl beside him, texting, I love you notes. God, God just showed up. No longer are we thinking about what we're going to do as soon as the sermon's over, how fast can I get to the golf course when God shows up. All of a sudden, it's not just about being in church, because I do that on Sunday. God showed up. And he calls for some help, and they just can't help him because they don't have the answer. I mean, as I said before, they should have been able to, to read these words, but they can't read. It doesn't make any sense to them. And, and, and it says at this point, it says, and so it, the trouble, it troubled the king even more that he even grows more pale. And, of course, the queen mother comes in. We got a solution. Let's get Daniel. And so they call for, for Daniel. And he comes in. He's the, the solution in her mind, but not the solution that she wants. Verses 10 and 12, uh, she says, you know, you need to check out this guy, Daniel. Uh, he worked for your dad. In fact, your dad named, you, you're named Belshazzar. Your dad named him Belteshazzar. You got something in common. Looks the same, but not the same. Almost the same, but not the same. Here's the thing about it, as I said earlier, they had to go get Daniel. He wasn't at the party with everybody else. And when he gets there, they say, we heard about you. I've heard about you. So I remember in high school, uh, we had a lot of people in, in, in my high school where I graduated from that uh, said they were Christians. I, I was one of those said I was Christian. 
I, you know, I wasn't any more Christian than Man of the Moon was. You know, I went to church. I was Baptist. I know the jails are full of them. But <laughs> been a good, you know, semi-good kid. In my mind, I had my own standard of righteousness. I was all right. There was one kid I remember. I don't know if you remember Camille. His name was Randy. And he always carried around a Bible. People made fun of him. Kind of a cowboy kid, you know, kind of. Peace straw hanging out with a man with a cowboy head, you know. But he always had his Bible with him. He always talked about Jesus wherever he went. You know? Now, I discovered later in my life that Randy was probably the most popular, well known kid in the school. Not popular in the sense some of you think of popularity, but everybody knew who Randy was. Randy stood for something. Randy was the only one that stood for something, as far as I could see. But everybody, you know, I couldn't tell you the names of 98% of the people I went to high school with, but I remember Randy. <laughs> Oh, skinny, scrawny cowboy Randy that loved Jesus. And some of you, some of you still, some of you my age and you're still living in high school. And you think, well, I wonder what so and so is doing. Hey, that dream girl you thought, hey, she, she's 300 pounds and gray headed, all right? <laughs> that dream boat boyfriend you're thinking about, oh, Lord, you know, he ain't got any hair left. You know? Shriveled up, starting to look like, like a prune. It's, it's, come to grips with reality, all right? So Daniel enters the party, and let's just wrap it up with, 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 with briefly what his sermon was. In fact, it's a four-point sermon, and I kind of gave it an acrostic to his, his basic four points. I, I use the word kill, all right, for the acrostic, because it's appropriate to what happens with a party. First of all is K, in K I L L. K, you knew what was right. In other words, it shouldn't take you by surprise, Belshazzar, that God has showed up here, and he's not happy. It shouldn't alarm you at all. You know the facts. I, I mean, Belshazzar was a kid when his dad went nuts. He knows what happened. He knows what happened. He saw his father. And you can be sure that when day came, when his father was restored to his sanity, he sat down with his son and said, I messed up. God's on the throne, not me. I blew it. But he's probably back there, you know, like most kids in our culture today. Well, my mom, my dad had messed up. I wouldn't be this way. I just met up. My mom, she met up. My dad, he met up. I was, that's why I met up. <laughs> oh, grow up. They might have been absolute idiots. That doesn't mean you have to be one too. Be a man. Be a woman. Stand up. Count for something. Get right with God. Quit making excuses about your parents. He said, you knew the truth. How can you continue to live the way you're living, acting the way you're acting, doing what you're doing, knowing what you know? He said, you know about your father. And, and you can read this sermon. It gets down to verses 16 through 22. I'm giving the abbreviated form. I know most of you don't think I abbreviate anything when I preach. But Second word is I. You ignored it. You knew it and you ignored it. You knew it and you sought excuses. You knew, you knew what was right and you didn't do anything about it. You just let it go. You let it fly. Your way was better. You thought you'd, you could try to, ch because you were you, that somehow it would be different. And it doesn't work that way, does it? You may be different from everybody in the room here today, but the principles are all the same. God is still the same. The wages of sin is still death for everybody. The soul that sins shall die is still for everybody. Even Christians, when you walk in disobedience, hey, there's a price to pay. You're not going to get away with it. And this brings me to the next day where he said, you know, even though you knew, you ignored it. And what did you do? You lifted up yourself. Just the same thing your dad did. You did the same thing, and you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. When you knew better, you did it anyway. And apparently, I believe he had plenty of opportunity to get his life right. I mean, Daniel's in the palace, you know, his dad has told him a thousand times where to, where to make the right decisions, but now he's just ignored it and doing his own thing, living his own life. You know, you lift up yourself against the Lord of heaven. You can't, you can't elevate yourself above God. You say, well, pastor, I would never try to elevate myself above God. Oh, you do it all the time. Yeah, we do it all the time. When God tells us not to do something, we say, I'm going to do it anyway. It's not what I do. You just did it. Yeah. God tells you not to do something. You do it anyway. God tells you to do something. You don't do it. You say, God, you're not God. I am. I know what you said. I know what the book said. It's not going to apply to me, man. I'm, 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 I'm neutral here. You know, I'm, 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 I'm cushioned. I got protection. 
I'm the king. You lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the last L is it's too late. That's what we said. It's a story of judgment. Too late. Too late. No getting right tonight. It's over for you. Now to show the stupidity, you know, of him, even after he gets this message of the many, many tickle you farson, you know, those words that, that had to do with the prophecy over his life and what God was going to do, he just ignores it all. The word mene had to do with, and it's used twice for numbered and finished, all right? By the way, all our lives are numbered, aren't they? Every one of us. We have a certain amount of days. It, it could be 10,000 days. It could be 100,000 days. It could be three days. We don't know what our life is. You, you don't know if you're going to get up in the morning. What makes, you think, what makes you actually think you're going to get up in the morning? You can't even breathe another breath if God didn't give you permission. No, I can only draw another breath because God loves me to. If he says that's enough, I'm out of oxygen. I don't care if everybody around me is breathing. It's over. Number did not finish. You ran the length of the time you had to get right with God and you wouldn't do it. And then we use this word tikkun, which has to do being weighed, weighed in a balance, used of, of justice balance is what it's talking about. You remember, when, you might have seen the stories, even with liberty justice, she's holding the balance of justice and has the scale on one side. That's kind of the way I thought about God in, at one point in my life. I thought, well, I'll stand before God. Okay, I, I go with that. And what God's going to do is he's going to put my good stuff on one side, bad stuff on the other side. Have you ever thought that? And man, if my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff, whew, I'm going to heaven. You know, I, I can almost see myself standing there, things tottering back and forth. There, but what about I help that little old lady? A little more. <laughs> but the problem's not that. That's not the way it works. There is this scale of justice, but what's on one side is the very best. Your very best, which is not as much as we think. All right, your very best, and over here is God's righteousness. You're in trouble. Why? Because the Bible says, because of sin, we fall short. We're not going to meet the standard. And every one of us are going to be weighing the balance. We're, you know, we say, well, how's it working today, Joe? Jesus in me, so guess what happens? Christ in you, hope of glory. So therefore, we have balance. No, no help for you if you're out of balance. And only God can bring that balance. Only he can give you this gift that's called righteousness. You farsen, kind of a dual term terminology here. Being divided is what I had meaning, but also from word that they got the word for Persians which was the next kingdom that was coming up on the scene, which is a kingdom he thought he was well satisfied and protected from. I remember when the field priest, was, he, he described the Babylonian walls. They were 87 feet thick and 311 feet high with 250 towers surrounding them. Outside that was a moat fed by the Euphrates River. Outside that was another smaller wall. Impenetrable. Nobody's getting in. Nobody's conquering me. How many people feel like that? I'm good. I'm set. I'm okay. Everything, I'm, I'm, I'm settled, man. I'm going to be all right. But nothing is invincible to God. Nothing. And by the way, the little excuse, well, my daddy's a preacher. It ain't going to work. My Uncle Tom, he was a righteous man. My mama, she loved Jesus. Not going to fly. We're all accountable for our own lives and our own sins and what we're going to do with God. And nothing. You can hide behind your drugs. You can hide behind money. You can hide behind fame. You can hide behind fortune. You can hide behind popularity. But every one of those walls are going to come tumbling down. That night, history tells us and teaches us, and the Bible repeats it, is that that night, the Medes and the Persians formed an alliance and they dammed up the Euphrates River that ran through the middle of that city under the wall and the Euphrates began to dry up and they sent their armies underneath the walls. And conquered. And the Bible, that story ends with, and that night, Belteshazzar died. End of story. The stupidity of Belshazzar here is that why he's being told this, and why the Medes and the Persians are coming under the walls, he's sitting there after he hears Daniel's sermon. He says, that was a good sermon, preacher. Uh, bring him a purple robe. Give him a gold chain. Make him the third ruler of the kingdom. Well, the kingdom's done. And even when Daniel comes, he's hitting him with a love offering to start with. Hey, Daniel, I'll don't do this for you if you'll tell me what this means. Which Daniel says, keep your bribe. You can't buy God. That night, it says that Daniel saw Belshazzar die. The storyline, well, there has to be a moral, right, to the story. I guess the moral should be a question, you know. Is God riding on the banquet wall of your heart? What's God saying to you? What's God doing in your life? What has God done in your life? Every one of us in here, we can have these 
critical moments in our life. And if we ignore them, then the same message is there. You knew, you ignored, you chose to you lift yourself up, do your own thing, and now it's too late. Don't cross over into tombstone territory. If God is speaking to your heart today, I'd get right. And for Christians, I'm going to tell you seriously, Christians, the Bible says in verse John, hey, there's a sin unto death. There could be a too late period for you. You'll go to heaven. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you'll be saved. So by fire, it's going to be a mighty judgment that's going to fall when you stand before God. And that's what Paul was so afraid of. He says, you know, my greatest fear is I've become a castaway. That everything I did for the glory of God means nothing anymore. You know, I want my life to count here and there. So for Christians, I would say the message is pretty clear. If the Spirit is convicting your heart about getting right with God, lay down whatever's in your life. Get it right with God. For you that don't know Christ, have never really surrendered your heart to Jesus, it's a pretty clear message, is it not? Repent and believe. The path you're on, is it taking you anywhere? The life you're living, is it satisfying you? Is the direction you're headed, is that where you really want to go? Is that where you want to be 10 years from now? If the Lord gives you 10 years, is that, is that really what you want? When there's so much more, I'd ask you to stand with your heads bowed.